Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to have you all here on this year tonight. It's wonderful to see such a big crowd and uh, to enhance our Cholamoid with some Devei Torah and powerful Devei Torah. Um, it's really an honor and a pleasure to welcome my Rebbe, Rabbi Elchanan Adler, to uh, KMS, virtual KMS, here this evening. Um, it's really a thrill every year to be able to welcome him on Achron Shel Pesach and give multiple shiurim and shul. And while it's not the same, not being in person and not hearing multiple shiurim, uh, this is the best we can do this year. And uh, it's especially appropriate to, to dedicate the shir uh, to our very own Dr. Alan Gason's memories, Echon Ali Bracha, uh, Rabbi Adler's father-in-law, and um, Eliyahu ben Menachem Endel Cohen. Hope his neshama should have an aliyah. Uh, it was always Alan's great pleasure to come and hear Rabbi Adler on Achram Shel Pesach in KMS, and he exerted much effort to be able to do so. And um, it's beautiful to have Sheila and some of the children on the line today, too, as well for the shir. I wish the entire family, Adler family, much bracha, hatzlacha, only nechama from the wonderful memories we all have uh, of Alan, which continue to enhance uh, our lives and our appreciation of life, which he really gave to all of us. I hope uh, that these Divrei Torah should be a chizuk for the family and for our whole community and for his neshama as well. Uh, thank you so much, Rabbi Adler, for taking the time to join us again and upholding the chazaka that we have. We can't break the chazaka, and it uh, gives me much pleasure to see your face as well. I did post the uh, Makoro sheet, the psukim that you asked, so hopefully people can see it if they want. If you want me to put it up on the screen, I'm happy to do that at some point uh, as well. And uh, without further ado, Rabbi Adler. Okay, thank you. Thank you with wonderful introduction. Moadim with simcha, gluten moe to everybody. Uh, friends, I don't need to tell you that we are living through very difficult and challenging times. Uh, in reality, which is literally unprecedented, um, with a quarter of the world's population living under some degree of lockdown, so many people who have been, so many people who unfortunately have succumbed to an invisible enemy. Uh, our whole regular routine has been disrupted and turned on its, turned on its head. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety, and what lies ahead is unpredictable. And yet, we are a resilient people. Our Pesach plans certainly turned out quite differently than we had anticipated, but we do celebrate Pesach nonetheless, and we celebrate Pesach with a spirit of optimism and hope. Pesach is, of course, Man Cheruseinu. Nisan is a season of Geula. And let us hope that somehow we will all be strengthened through this, both individually and collectively, and that we in fact merit to see the Geula, the redemption of Am Yisrael, and a more perfect world with the coming of Mashiach Mehera B'yameinu, Amen. So as you know, this virtual Zoom shear is given in the tradition of an annual Scholar-in-Residence program at KMS on Acheron Shel Pesach. It's really always been a highlight of my yantif to come and to visit with Rabbi Weinberg, who I can proudly claim as a Talmud going back quite a number of years. And uh, the Gemara tells us, Vishinan Talmud doesn't just mean literally your children, it actually means your Talmudim. If there are, if a prize Talmud that I can genuinely feel that sense of pride as a son, it would be Rabbi Weinberg. And I, I want to thank you, Rabbi Weinberg, for coming up with this alternative way of continuing our tradition. I also want to thank Arya Shadovsky, the executive director of KMS, for all, all of his logistical help and all those who were involved in coordinating this year. In past years, as you just heard, um, on Achron Shal Pesach, these shiurim were attended by my late father-in-law, Dr. Alan Gason, Zichonu Lebracha. I know how much it meant to him to be able to come, and how much he appreciated the words of Torah. My father-in-law, who passed away last summer, was extremely beloved in the Silver Spring community, and so I thought it would be very appropriate to dedicate this year in his memory. I want to acknowledge my mother-in-law, Mrs. Sheila Gason, who's here with us in this virtual space. Uh, Mommy, I, I wish we could be with you in person, as well as with the rest of the family and all of you together. I want to thank all of you for tuning in, for your participation, and I'd like to get right to, right to the topic of this year. So this entire year revolves around five pesukim that would normally be read in shul on the seventh day of Pesach. Unfortunately, 
We won't have the opportunity this year to do it in shul, but we can certainly look at the laying ourselves. These are the five sukim that conclude, that conclude that last aliyah, that would, that would be the last aliyah. <clears throat> it's an episode that occurred shortly after the miracle of Kriyas Yamsuf, the splitting of the sea. And I think it will be worth looking at your sheets together with me, if, Rabbi Weinberg, if you want to post it, we can do it that way, or we can, you know, people can look at whatever they printed out. Great. So I'd like to begin by reading with you these five psukim and really try to dissect what lies within these lines, these words, and try to come up with a certain perspective. So the background here is in Parshas B'Shalach, the Torah records how the Bnei Yisrael, after the Kriyas Yamsuf, they traveled for three days in the desert, as it says in the first Pasuk, Vayasa Moshe es Yisrael mi Yamsuf, Vayetsu el mi Bashur, they went into the desert, Vayelchu shlosh es Yamim ba Midbar, velo matzu umayim. They traveled for three days in the desert and they could not find any water. So their next Pasuk, the second of the five, Vayavau Marasa, they arrived in a place called Mara. Mara. They were unable to drink of that water in Mara. Ki marim heim, because the water was bitter. Alkein karish mamara. That's why the place was named Mara, because of the bitter waters. Okay, that's our second pasuk. Now let's get to the crux of the story. So the people grumbled, as the translation here has it. They complained against Moshe, saying, what shall we drink? The fourth pasuk, Moshe cries out to Hashem, Hashem Hashem showed Moshe a piece of wood, Moshe threw it into the water, and the water became miraculously sweet. And here the Pasuk concludes with a very interesting phrase, Sham sam lo chok mishpat, v'sham nisahu. Here we have a couple of points being made in juxtaposition with the miracle of sweetening the water. Sham sam lo chok mishpat, there he placed or he made for them, for the nation that is, chok mishpat, a rule, a, uh, a, a, some kind of a system of law, chok, or mishpat, a statute, an ordinance, v'sham nisahu, and there he put them to a test. All right, that's the fourth of the five psukim. A lot here, obviously, to, to delve into. Final pasuk, vayomer, and he said, im shamar tishma l'kol Hashem elokecha, this would be either Moshe speaking or Hashem speaking, it's a little bit ambiguous. It does refer to Hashem here as the third person, but as we'll see, it shifts back to the first person. So sometimes you find even Hashem speaking in the third person. If you listen to the voice of Hashem, you'll do what is just in his eyes. You'll pay close attention to his mitzvahs. You will observe his statutes. So the guarantee is given, all of the diseases that I have placed against the Egyptians, I will not place on you, because I am Hashem, your healer. Okay, so here we read and we translated five sukim that require much in the way of elucidation. And let's see if we can identify a number of questions that emerge from reading these psukim. One of the main ideas that we've read, we can probably put the, the sheet away if you wish. Uh, one of the main ideas that we've, that we've noticed here. So there is the three days without water, and then the water is bitter, and they don't know how to, what to do. The water is bitter. Most Rabbeinu miraculously, by Hashem's guidance, throws some wood into the water and becomes sweet. So that's one piece of the story. Connected with that is the fact that he placed before them some kind of system of, of law. What does that mean exactly? And what about the test that's connected to it? So what is the significance of, this, of the miracle of sweetening the water? How does that aspect of the story connect, relate to the other facets of the story, the law, 
that was set up for them, the test that was set up, and then the notion of healing that we read in the last Pasuk. What does that have to do with the other, other parts of the story? What laws were presented at this point, at this juncture? Chok mishpat, what is being referred to here? Finally, what about the test? What was the test? What was the nature of the test? And did they pass the test or did they not pass the test? And finally, I guess one more point, the assurances about the illnesses of Egypt, how does that connect with anything that we're talking about? So there's really a lot here that has to be understood because it's a very enigmatic section of the Torah. We don't usually pay close attention to it because it's tagged on to the Aliyah of the Kriyas Yamsuf, which of course gets our attention, grabs our attention, and then we sort of gets anticlimactic and we end with these five verses, which of course have so much to tell us. And I think that there's one single overarching idea that would unite all the different strands of the Torah's account of Mara, and the theme that emerges from these various strands, you could say, have a very powerful and inspiring message, which in so many ways epitomizes my father-in-law, Dr. Alan Gason, Elio ben Menachem Mendel HaKohen, Olav Shalom, both as a Jew and as a human being. So let's begin by exploring first the nature of the Choku Mishpat, the law that was given in Mara. What exactly is meant by Choku Mishpat? So I want to start with Rashi. I'm going to read for you Rashi's comment on this Pasuk. You have the Tzukim, I'll read you the Rashi. Rashi says, Sham sam lo choku mishpat, b'mara nasan lahem mixas parshios shel Torah she yisasku bahem. In Mara, he placed before them a selection of portions of the Torah that they should be involved with. Which sections of the Torah? Rashi goes on and identifies a few different mitzvahs. Shabbos, the mitzvah of Shabbos, Para Aduma, the mitzvah of the red heifer, you know, the ashes of the red heifer were used to purify someone who was Tommy Mace, who became uh, impure by coming into contact with the dead body. And Dinim, Dinim means a system of laws that we find in Pashas Mishpatim having to do with damages and the like, custodianships, responsibilities of when you're liable, when you're not liable for damages and things like that. So these are the mitzvahs that Rashi identifies over here in his comment to the Pasuk Shabbos, Para Aduma, and Dinim. Um, there is another Rashi which is, appears in Pashas Mishpatim, which is also based on the Gemara, that adds another mitzvah to the list, and that's the mitzvah of Kibbut Avaim, honoring one's parents. So we have a number of mitzvahs that were given to B'nai Israel when they arrived in Mara. So we have Shabbos, Kibbut Avaim, Para Aduma and Dinim. Now, what exactly do we make of the language of Rashi? The language of Rashi is interesting in that Rashi says, Nasan Lahem mixas parshios shel Torah, she asku bahen. The words of Rashi seem to suggest that the purpose of these mitzvot was for the sake of being involved in their study, in understanding their message. And this is something that the Ramban picks up on. The Ramban infers from the language of Rashi that these mitzvot were not yet binding as bona fide obligations. Rather, what was the purpose of giving these mitzvot right now if they weren't binding? The Ramban explains that the purpose was to acclimate the Jewish people to the world of mitzvot. His words are, to get them accustomed to mitzvot, to afford them the opportunity to engage with these laws intellectually, and to fulfill them in the capacity of what we call eno mitzuve ve'ose, one who is not necessarily commanded yet, but does the mitzvah nonetheless, voluntarily. The Ramban adds another point as well. He says that Hashem wanted to measure the degree of enthusiasm that the Jewish people would exhibit by embracing this mitzvot. 
And to the degree that they would accept these mitzvot with a sense of joy, that would serve as a barometer for their readiness to assume the formal yoke of mitzvot at the appropriate time, which would come later on. These are the more or less the ideas that the Ramban explains in, based on the language of Rashi. So according to the Ramban's insight, he goes on to say, what was the test of the Sham Nisahu? The Ramban says the test was a reference to this non-binding introductory phrase, which would portend the Bnei Yisrael's formal entry into the covenant of mitzvot, which would come subsequently. So Hashem wanted to put out a feeler, if you will, to test them to see how they'll do. They'll get a little accustomed to the mitzvot, and then we'll see if we're ready to proceed to the next step of formally commanding them in these mitzvot and all of the rest of the mitzvot as well. All right, so let's pause for a, section, for a second and think about the nature of these particular mitzvot, which according to the Ramban, as we said, they're not binding yet. They're a way for B'nai Yisrael to get comfortable with mitzvot, to think about the mitzvot intellectually, to engage with them without being formally commanded. Why these particular mitzvot? What, what common theme do these mitzvot have? What types of ideas would emerge for B'nai Yisrael to glean from being involved and occupied with the study of these particular mitzvot? And I believe the answer is the common feature of all these mitzvot is that all of them promote in one form or another the establishment of social norms that are crucial to the functioning of a civil society. Broadly speaking, they all reflect values that we would call derech eretz, respecting the rights of others, feeling and expressing gratitude, exercising self-control, self-discipline over one's base tendencies, etc. Now, the most obvious example of this would be dinim. Dinim are the corpus of laws that we have outlined in Parshas Mishpatim with a heavy emphasis on crimes of an interpersonal nature. If you cause damage, you have to make restitution. If you take assume responsibility for something that somebody gave you for safekeeping, there are standards for when you have to pay and when you don't have to pay. This is obviously crucial for any society to function. Kibbut aim, honoring one's parents, obviously on the most basic level, this is an expression of gratitude toward people uh, whose, who every human being owes his or her existence to. Obviously that's very basic to human nature, kibbut aim. Observing Shabbos, is an exercise in self-discipline. It entails a great measure of self-sacrifice. You work for six days and then you have to throw away your proverbial hammer and nails and you have to put it aside and not work on the seventh day. Also, it instills within a person the recognition that there's a higher authority who created the world, who's a master of one's destiny. All of that comes out of the mitzvah of Shabbos. Finally, thinking about paraduma, the paradoxical nature of this mitzvah, the enigmatic aspect of the mitzvah, how a person can say, I don't understand something. Why does the red heifer become the vehicle for bringing somebody closer to Hashem? If they're impure, how does it make somebody pure? And at the same time, those who are involved with it are getting it ready, are going to become impure. It's the ultimate act of intellectual surrender to that which, be, which is beyond the, the span of human comprehension. So really all of these mitzvot, each in their own way, is meant to instill that well-rounded perspective of what we could call derech eretz. And so this is why the Ramban would tell us that there's a trial balloon for these commandments that we now have given in Mara. This is really an expression of that, what we all know, derech eretz kadma la Torah. We've all heard that expression. It's based on a medrash in Parshas Tzav, but really it's what's happening right now. In order to accept the Torah, you first have to pass the test of showing that you have common decency as a prerequisite. We all know that to the extent that a person is deficient in the rudimentary concepts associated with derech eretz, a person whose character traits are unrefined, a person who lacks basic decency, 
is really not capable of living with the standards of the Torah, of a Torah lifestyle. It's very interesting because the Ramban himself, after explaining Rashi's explanation of Choku Mishpat, the Ramban has his own explanation, which he calls Adera Hapshat. And according to the Ramban, it's not necessarily mitzvot per se that were given in Mara, but if I can read you a few words of that Ramban, further on he says, when Moshe is teaching B'nai Yisrael in the form of Choku Mishpat is Lisbo Hara'a V'hatsama. They have to learn how to endure the realities of life in the wilderness, hunger and thirst, to call out when they're hungry or thirsty to Hashem, not in a manner of complaining, derech teluna, but in a manner of sophistication. Mishpatim, what's the mishpat? Mishpatim sheyichyu bahem. Ordinances to live by in the wilderness. What kinds of things? Says the Ramban, lehov ish esre ehu, so that one person loves his fellow man. Lehesnaheit ba'atsas haskenim, to conduct oneself in accord with the counsel of the elders, respect your elders. When you act with a sense of privacy, with modesty in your tents regarding the women and the children. Another thing, throughout the years in the desert, suppose somebody would come visit, and if you have a visitor come in, do you greet them? Do you act nicely? Do you, do you give them a reception? All of this is part of mishpat. The Ramban says, in order to establish that they should act in a way that is restrained, they should not behave in a manner like the camps of marauders. They act in a way without any taboos on what they do, all kinds of abominations. So what the Ramban is saying, is precisely what we are suggesting within the explanation that he offers for Rashi. Basically, the point of Mara was to accentuate the idea of Derech Eretz, Kadma la Torah. So now let's take this step a step further. Let's analyze the meaning of the test, the Sham Nisahu. We've already seen that the Ramban explains within the Pshat of Rashi that the test has to do with feeling out how B'nai Yisrael will react to these mitzvot, how excited they'll be, how enthusiastic they'll be. But it's interesting that Rashi offers a different interpretation for himself within his own explanation of what the test was. And I read you the explanation of Rashi of Visham Nisahu, there he tested them. Rashi says, Visham Nisahu La'am, he tested the people, Vira'a Kishe Arpan, he saw their stubbornness. They didn't consult Moshe with appropriate, refined language. Remember the word of the Pasuk was, If we saw the translation from Sfariah, they took it, they grumbled. Says Rashi, Visham Nisahu, Hashem saw their stubbornness. They didn't ask nicely. They didn't say, Moshe, please, Davin, ask Hashem for water. Ella, rather, what did they do? They just complained, the Slonanu. That is the meaning of the test. Now, this is very interesting because according to Rashi's interpretation, it emerges that this test was not a test that the B'nai Yisrael passed. It was a test that they failed miserably at. They didn't ask for the water in the proper way. They could have asked nicely, but they used demanding language, unrefined language in expressing their gripes regarding the water. Now this is perplexing. Why would Hashem subject his people to a test that they were destined to fail? Secondly, why does the Torah ju juxtapose the mention of the test with the system of laws that were presented to the nation? If you go back and look at the language of the Pasuk, Sham Sam Lo Choko Mishpat, this is, okay, 
yeah, take another look at the words. In Pasuk, um, in the fourth Pasuk, so, now, the test that they failed is in the beginning of the story, in the previous Pasuk, where it says, So here's where they failed the test, according to Rashi. Now the Pasuk, the next Pasuk says, he, he cried out, Moshe cried out, Hashem showed him a piece of wood, he threw the wood into the water, the water turned sweet, and suddenly the Torah the Torah tells us how he gave them mitzvos, and suddenly the Torah gives us a, you know, a step back, takes us a step back to the beginning of the story, v'sham nisahu. Like, why is the Torah telling us about the test that the Jews failed after everything else that it tells us? And what's the connection between the two parts of the end of the Pasuk? Sham samlachoko mishpat means he gave them these various laws, as Rashi has it, Shabbos, Dinim, Paraduma, we added Kibbut of Aim. And then saying in the same breath, Visham Nisahu, that he tested them, meaning he saw that they didn't know how to ask properly for water. They were exposed and they failed the test. Like the whole way that the Torah is, is putting everything in sequence seems very, very strange. But I think the answer should become clear to us in light of how we introduced the idea of the message of Mara, the message of these mitzvot. We pointed out that these mitzvot specifically encapsulate the norms of Derech Eretz. And the purpose of these mitzvot was to instill within the people the values of Derech Eretz, which would emerge from them becoming familiar with these mitzvot, even though they're not yet commanded. And now we can appreciate what the Torah is saying. Why were the people subjected to a test that they were destined to fail? And the answer is to provide them with a chance to look at the proverbial mirror, to allow them and to see, to show them empirical evidence of their own deficiencies within the realm of Derech Eretz, so that they can be treated with a regimen of Derech Eretz principles. If you don't know what you're missing, you're not gonna look for the cure. And therefore, now that they recognize that as they begin to recognize what Derech Eretz is, and they realize, wow, we didn't get it. We were so lacking Derech Eretz in the manner in which we asked for our water. And now that they begin to study Shabbos, and Kibbutz of the Aim, and Paraduma, and Dinim, and they begin to realize this is how to change our behavior. The Torah juxtaposes the failure of the test with the fact that they were given the portions of Torah Meaning, why did Hashem give them the Chokul Mishpat at this point? Why did he do it as an antidote to the fact that Bisham Nisahu, that he, he had tested them and they didn't, they didn't pass the test, they needed help, and that's why Hashem provides them with the help that he did in the form of the mitzvot. And it was because it became, became so apparent to them that now they're willing to take the remedy and appreciate what they can gain from the learning of these mitzvot. It would heighten their awareness of the degree of their lack and would simultaneously provide them <clears throat> with a roadmap for building their character in the future. <clears throat> now, with this in mind, we focus so far on the chokul mishpat and on the test. Let's now broaden our focus to the sweetening of the water. How does all that connect? After all, the Torah speaks about the water turning sweet in the same sentence that it speaks about the fact that they were given the laws that they were given and the test. So what is the significance of the symbolism, if you will, of the water becoming sweet? We all understand there's a metaphor here. What is compared to water as we know? Torah is compared to water. The Torah's ways, as we know, are described as darche noam. Tvachecha darche noam. Its paths are sweet, which is a testament, test, a testament to the critical link between Torah and possessing a pleasant character. The Gemara talks about how a person who, who is one who is knowledgeable in Torah, so the best thing they can do is to create a Kiddush Hashem in all they do so that people recognize Torah is what gives them that beautiful character. Praiseworthy is their, their parents. Praiseworthy are their, is their Rebbe. Um, if Derech Eretz is a prerequisite for Torah, 
then the metaphor of the bitter waters of Mara would symbolize the deficiencies that the people had at this juncture in Derech Eretz. It was not yet a Torah that we could quote Derech Eretz, Derech Enoam. The water was, sweet, was bitter. But the water can become sweet. Sweetening the water is a metaphor for infusing Derech Eretz within the equation, as reflected by the curriculum of study that's mentioned here. And through that, there's a transformation from the bitter water to becoming sweet. What it means is the Torah has the ingredient of derech eretz, the Torah becomes derech derech Noah. Now let's turn to the metaphor of healing. Because what happens in the last Pasuk, after the water turns sweet, and after they're giving the chokum, given the chokum mishpat, the laws, and the test, then the final Pasuk, we can take another look at it, the Pasuk says, Vayomer im shamoa tishma l'kol Hashem alokecha. If you listen to my laws, again, with the spirit of derech eretz, as we now brought into the mix, the derech eretz aspect. And v'shavazantel mitzvosav, v'shamartel kochukav, all of this will mean the following. Kol ha-machala ashesamti b'mitzrayim, all of the illness, all the disease that I've placed against the Egyptians, lo asim malacha, I will not place on you. Ki ani Hashem rofecha, I am Hashem, your healer. Let's understand in light of how we've been explaining this entire section, what is the significance of this last passage? Why does Hashem assure the people right now that by fulfilling the mitzvot, they'll be spared the illnesses of Egypt? Why does Hashem identify himself right now as a healer? How do these themes connect with the sweetening of the water and the laws given in Mara? So there is a prayer that is recited at the time of Birchas Kohanim, which unfortunately, again, we won't have the privilege this uh, last days of Yantif to do, but hopefully for Shavuos, Be'ezras Hashem. And that is a prayer that people recite for their dreams to become better. It's something that the non-Kohanim, those in the congregation, are saying while the Kohanim are chanting and singing uh, at the three points that they do, at Yivarechecha, at the Chunak, at Shalom. Now, in that prayer of Ribona Shalom, we speak about how our dreams are dreams we don't really understand. We don't know what to make of them, but we know that dreams represent potential, and we want that potential to be actualized if it's good potential. If it's not good potential, we don't want that that potential to come to realization. And in that prayer, we talk about the concept of healing, specifically in connection to the waters of Mara. And we say, if our dreams need some kind of healing, then let Hashem heal these, heal our dreams, like you healed Chizkiyot the king when he was sick, like you healed Miriam when she had Saras, like you healed Naaman, the general of Aram, when he had a tsaras, and finally, Ukimei Mara, or number four, Ukimei Mara al Yidei Moshe Rabbeinu. Like you healed the waters of Mara. In other words, the story of Mara's waters, the transformation of the water from bitter to sweet, is connected to the metaphor of healing. And again, we saw that in the last Pasuk, as we've noted. What does that have to do with the message of the mitzvahs of Mara as we've been describing? And the answer is as follows. There are numerous Gemaros that speak about Torah and the values of Torah as representing a healing of sorts, as a remedy, as a potion. To give you one or two examples, the Gemara in Kedushin on Daf Mem the Gemara says, "Besamtem es devarai ele." It says in Shema, "We should put these words on your heart." The Gemara says, "Kedushin daf lamid." Besamtem sam tam. Sam could be read as if it were written with a samuch. Samuch mem is interchangeable with sin mem or shin mem. Sam samuch mem is a potion. Tam means it's perfect. It works. It's effective. Nimshila Torah. Kisam. The Torah is compared to a remedy. And if a person has a wound and you put some bandage on it, so the father would tell the child, leave this bandage on and you'll be okay. So it is, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to B'nai Yisrael, says the Gemara, 
Barasi Yetzahara, I created the evil inclination, but Barasi Lo Torah Tavlin, I've created Torah as a remedy for that. This is one of many Gemaras that connects Torah with healing. It's interesting. We used the word Sam, didn't we? If you go back to the actual Pasuk that we had here, where the Torah speaks about the mitzvot of Mara, the, the words appear in the Pasuk in striking fashion. Sam, Sam lo chok u mishpat. Notice, right when the Torah speaks about these mitzvot that are given, you have the two words, one after the other in succession, which both of them are a way of expressing the word sam, which means, again, a, a potion, a healing. You actually have it three times in the Pasuk. You have it sham, you have it sam, and then you have, again, the sham. Perhaps it's not a coincidence, because the message of these mitzvot is mitzvot are meant to serve as a metaphor for healing. The Maharsha in Chidushi Agados to Mitzach Shabbos Tav Samach Zayin connects the idea of refuas hanefesh, which is a refua for a person's character flaws, to refuas haguf, to the idea of medicine that's used for a physical ailment. And he connects it to that Gemara that we just read in Kedushin, Barasi Yitzahara, Barasi Gol Torah Tavlin, and the Masha goes on to connect it as well to the Pasuk over here of Kiani Hashem Rof Echa, that Torah can serve as a refuah in the sense for a person's character flaws. So now I think we can understand why the Torah mentions the fact that the promise given here, if you will observe my mitzvot, the mitzvot here of Mara, that are meant to create a paradigm of derech eretz, which is the foundation of Torah. If you really observe these mitzvot and you understand what they mean and you get their message, that all of the illnesses, all of the diseases that are placed against Mitzrayim. Why do we mention Mitzrayim here? There is a Pasuk in Yeshaya that speaks about the Makos in the following way. The Pasuk speaks about Hashem striking Egypt. The Pasuk appears in Yeshaya, Yutes Chav Beis. The Nagaf Hashem es Mitzrayim, Nagof Verafo. Hashem strikes Egypt, Striking and healing. Now, the, the Pasuk may be referring to a prophecy for the future, but the Zohar and other commentaries actually refer to the Makos and Mitzrayim with this Pasuk. And the Zohar says that there's a dual expression here, Nagof Berafo. Says the Zohar that the, the Makos that Hashem gave to the Mitzrayim, the ten Makos in Mitzrayim, had two parts to them. Nagof for Mitzrayim, Rafo Yisrael. The Makos had, on the one hand, the aspect of striking, which gave the Makos to the Egyptians. At the same time, there was a healing component for the Jewish people, a therapeutic component. What does this mean? So the Zohar associates it with the mitzvah brismila that B'nai Yisrael underwent in Mitzrayim. But many of the Svarim, like the Svas Emes and the Pritzadik, suggest that what this means is the Torah is alluding to a spiritual healing that came along with the Jewish peoples being speared, the horrible plagues that were visited upon Mitzrayim, because Mitzrayim was a culture that was steeped with licentiousness, with baseness, with a total lack of, you could say, derech eretz. And in effect, when they could see what was happening with Hashem's punishing hand against Mitzrayim, and recognizing how they were being speared, these ravages, it served a therapeutic function. It began to elevate the spiritual psyche of the Jewish people. It began the process of healing, of elevating their spirit. Of course, it was still a while to go, but it was the first step in that process. Now go the rough foe. Comes Hashem in Mara, and he says, now that you've become acquainted with the mitzvot of Mara, and you understand the message of what I'm trying to convey, what the essence of Torah is, and what Derech Eretz is, and how critical it is to Torah. I want you to know, I promise you in my capacity as healer, that if you observe the Torah, you'll be spared these illnesses of Egypt. 
which stemmed from a culture that was associated with a very low spiritual character. And instead, you will rise above that and you will now be in a place to go higher and higher on the level of Derech Eretz and ultimately to have the Torah with the Derech Eretz together and all the spiritual refinement that comes with it. And this was all, again, this was all meant in response to a lack that they became aware of in the form of how they asked for the water, which was not appropriate. And Hashem came at that moment and he tailored the remedy to the particular spiritual ailment. And that's why the notion of healing is very much part of the story. The sweetening of the waters is a healing, the metaphor being a spiritual healing, a healing of character. And Hashem therefore offers us these assurances if you follow this path, you'll be healed in the spiritual realm, just as you've been spared the plagues of Egypt in the past. Study Torah properly. That is the ultimate antidote to the Eight Sahara and all that comes with it, and it is our only assurance for our continued spiritual health. We, all of us, the world at large, during such stressful times of a world pandemic, we all seek healing. We know how Kadosh Baruch Hu is a Borei Refuos, and we hope and we pray that a cure will be found for this terrible virus. At the same time, if there's something that we can also work on as we have time to introspect and time to reflect as we are in so, much, so many ways on our own, perhaps this is also a time for spiritual introspection for Cheshbon HaNefesh in the form of our, our character building, how we can look at everything through the prism of Torah to integrate the Torah with the Derech Eretz to grow in both at the same time and to see how one reinforces the other and how they really all go hand in hand. My father-in-law, Dr. Alan Gason, Zichon Levracha, was a doctor by profession and his healing ability encompassed all of the qualities that we touched upon in this year. Not only did he heal patients by providing sound medical advice and dispensing medication, he also served as a constant role model through his personal conduct. Anyone who interacted with him, patients and acquaintances alike, felt uplifted by his down-to-earth menschlichkeit and by his common decency. His Torah was sweet, and his personality radiated a warmth and a sweetness. What he may have lacked in formal Torah knowledge, he, was, he more than compensated for in his intuitive grasp of how a life that embodied Derech Eretz to the fullest and how to live a life like that, which he did. He had a natural self-discipline, a genuine sense of being Sameach the Chalko, happy with his lot, never craving luxuries or other earthly pleasures. He carried himself with a genuine sense of humility, was constantly in awe of the infinite universe and all that lay beyond the realm of human comprehension. His personality bore a natural sweetness, a, a warm and pleasant disposition, and this sweetness of personality made everyone genuinely feel comfortable in his presence. He is sorely missed, and yet we continue to be inspired by his wonderful qualities. Yehi zichro baruch, may his memory be a blessing for the entire family, for all of us, for all Kal Yisrael. Amen, be amen. Thank you so much, Yosher Koch, Rather, That was really, really beautiful and gave so much depth, as you always do, to uh, a common concept, Derech Eretz Kad Torah, but giving it so much depth in the Psukim and the sources and the Gemaras and the Farshim and uh, really giving us a full grasp of uh, what our task should be and what our avodah should be in these days, uh, both to get through this time as well as to grow as human beings and uh, pay tribute to your father-in-law as Nishama should have an aliyah and everyone should just be blessed with a lot of refuah and uh, a wonderful yontif ahead. Thank you so much, Rav Adler. I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.